Before you took a break, we covered the methods of gaining bus control. We mentioned that there were two reasons for wanting the bus, for interrupts and for data transactions. Now we're going to discuss executing interrupts. We want to show you the entire sequence from requesting the bus to servicing the interrupt. We'll use an example to illustrate interrupt execution. Assume that our device requiring service is a tape unit which contains a record of preferred customers. The tape unit is feeding the customer names to a line printer which in turn is producing a mailing list. Unfortunately, an error occurs in the tape unit as the mailing list is being generated. It's necessary for the tape unit to inform the CPU of this error. However, before it can interrupt the CPU, the tape unit must issue a BR request to the priority control and receive a BG in acknowledgement. The tape unit then captures the bus by asserting bus busy while dropping sack so other bus requests can be granted. At the same time, it sends an interrupt signal to the CPU. Note also that the tape unit sends the address of an interrupt vector to the CPU. Let's see how this vector address is used. The vector address functions as a pointer. It directs the CPU to a specific location in memory where an interrupt vector is stored. This interrupt vector contains the starting address of a service routine that will analyze the tape unit's error condition. Before the CPU executes this service routine, it acknowledges the interrupt by sending a slave sync, or SSYN, signal to the device. This informs our tape unit that the CPU has received the address of its interrupt vector. Now that the CPU has the required information, our tape unit no longer needs the bus. Therefore, it releases bus control to the CPU by clearing bus busy, interrupt, and the vector address. At this point, the CPU clears slave sync, which is the last step in the interlock dialog. By clearing this signal, the processor informs the tape unit that it will start servicing its interrupt now that the bus is free. Now that we understand the interrupt dialog between a device and the CPU, let's see what the processor does when an interrupt occurs. Assume that our CPU is busy making up a new employee list when it receives an interrupt from the tape unit. The CPU immediately stops what it's doing, in this case, making a list of employees. Remember now, an interrupt can only occur between instruction cycles. Therefore, if the CPU happens to be in the middle of an instruction, it first completes execution of that instruction, then stops. Before the CPU services this interrupt, it takes breakpoint data, information that will allow it to return to the proper point in the employee listing program, and stores it on a hardware stack. This hardware stack is implemented in PDP-11 memory and will be described in detail in subsequent study units. Now that the CPU has stored essential breakpoint data, it is ready to service our tape units interrupt. As we saw earlier, when the tape unit issued its interrupt, it also supplied the address of an interrupt vector. The interrupt vector contains the starting address of a specific service routine. The CPU then retrieves and executes this routine. In this example, the service routine allows the CPU to analyze the error condition in the tape unit so that corrective action can be taken. Once the tape unit's interrupt has been serviced, the CPU retrieves the breakpoint data from the stack. Remember, this data will tell the CPU what it was doing when interrupted so it can pick up where it left off. That completes our discussion of interrupt execution. Now, let's see how the bus is used when data transactions are executed. Before executing a data transaction, the device must gain bus control by issuing an NPR signal. Once the request is honored and the bus becomes free, the device is ready to execute a data transaction. The bus master must first choose a slave to work with. Remember, each device in a PDP-11 has its own unique address. The master selects a slave by simply placing the slave's address on the bus. The slave will recognize its own address. The other devices will ignore the address. Once a slave is selected, 
the master must select the type of transaction to be performed. Does it want to send data out to the slave or does it want to receive data in from the slave? Now at this point we had better explain a little more about the various kinds of data transactions. There are actually four distinct types of transactions. Let's look at each one of these. This is called a data O transaction. Note that we are sending data out of the master and into the slave. Because it is data out of the master, we call this transaction a data O transfer. This is our second type of transfer, what we call a data OB. You can see that we are still transferring data out of the master, except that the data is a byte rather than a full word. Thus, we have two types of output transfers, a data O for transferring a word out of the master and a data OB for transferring a byte out of the master. Now, let's look at input transfers. Here you see data being transferred into the master device, hence the name data I. It's true that the information is coming from the slave, but remember this key point. All transfers are in relation to the master device. Now, let's look at the last of our four types of data transactions. Here, you again see data being sent into the master device, similar to a data I. However, in this case, we indicate a pause after the transfer and call this transaction a data IP. What is this pause used for? Well, it has to do with the characteristic of destructive readout devices, such as core memories. Let's briefly compare data I and data IP transactions. First, we'll look at the data I. During a typical memory cycle, the memory reads information from the selected core location and transfers it to the bus. Because data is lost when the core is read, the data must be rewritten into the same core location. Writing the data back into core is called the restore cycle. Now, suppose we are planning to write new data into the core location. Why bother to restore the old data when we know it's to be replaced? Why not just eliminate the restore cycle? Well, that's the purpose of a data IP transaction. It eliminates the restore cycle, thereby cutting the memory cycle time in half. Of course, we must always follow a data IP with either a data O or data OB to load the core with the new data. Before we go any further, there's one point that must be emphasized. Remember, the direction of the data transfer is always designated with respect to the master device. In the example at the top, the CPU is master and we have a data O. The transfer is out of the CPU. In the second example, the disk is the master, and we have a data I. The transfer is into the disk. Now that you understand the four types of data transactions, let's see how they're selected. Remember our control lines on the Unibus? Well, two of them are labeled C1 and C0. The master uses these two control lines to select one of the four possible data transactions. If the master places a zero on both lines, a data I is selected. A zero and a one selects a data IP. A one and a zero selects a data O, and lastly, two ones select a data OB. Thus, if the master wants to store information in memory, it places a one and a zero on the control lines to select a data O, causing data to be transferred out of the master and into the slave. Now we're going to look at the interlock dialog that occurs during all data transactions. All data transactions between a master and its slave device are synchronized using master sync and slave sync signals. Here's an example of how these two signals are used during a typical data O transaction. The master starts out by issuing a master sync or MSYN signal which says, take this data. Then the slave responds by issuing a slave sync, or SSYN signal. This informs the master that it has the data. In step number three, the master drops master sync, indicating that the transfer is complete. Then in step number four, the master drops bus busy because it no longer needs bus control.
Finally, the slave drops slave sink, indicating it has completed its function. Now, let's look at a typical data I transfer. When performing a data I, the master wants to retrieve data from the slave. You might notice that the signal names are the same as for a data O, but the function of each signal, or the dialogue, is different. In the case of a data I, the master first asserts master sync, thus saying, give me data. The slave places data on the bus and responds with a slave sync signal, which says, here it is. In step number three, the master drops master sync to indicate it received the data, and then in step number four, the master drops bus busy because it no longer needs the bus. In other words, the bus cycle is completed. Finally, the slave drops slave sync, indicating it has completed its job. We're going to review everything we have covered in this second study unit and then finish up with examples that should tie everything together. Don't try to memorize what we cover in this review. This material is repeated in your workbook. Let's start by reviewing the method for requesting bus control. We request control of the bus either for interrupts or for data transactions. When making a request for an interrupt, we start the sequence by asserting a BR request, which is honored by a BG grant from the priority control. Once honored, we clear the BR and assert SAC. While SAC is asserted, no other bus requests can be honored. Now that the device has responded, the priority control clears BG. Now let's look at the right-hand portion of our chart. When making a request for a data transaction, the sequence is identical. The only difference is that we assert an NPR rather than a BR, and our grant signal is an NPG rather than a BG. Now, let's go back to interrupts and assume our request has been honored. How do we execute the interrupt? Notice that we have two columns, one for the device and one for the CPU. The device starts the sequence by clearing SAC so other bus requests can be honored. At the same time, it asserts bus busy to take over the bus. It then places an interrupt signal on the bus along with a vector address that directs the CPU to the memory location that contains the device's interrupt vector. The CPU accepts the vector address and asserts slave sync to let the device know that the CPU has received the interrupt. The device now clears all of its signals because it knows the processor has taken over. The CPU then clears slave sync, thus completing the dialogue, and begins to service the interrupt. Now we're going to review the dialogue that takes place during a data transaction. We'll start with a data O. Remember now, the dialogue for a data OB is the same. The master starts by taking over the bus with bus busy. It also asserts the C0 and C1 lines to specify a data O, places an address on the bus to indicate where the data is to be stored, and then places the data on the bus. The slave decodes the address and realizes that it has been selected for use. The master then asserts master sync. The slave responds by accepting the data and asserting slave sync to let the master know data has been received. The master then clears all of its signals and the slave clears slave sync, thereby completing the transfer. A data I transaction is shown in the right hand portion of our chart. During the data I transaction, the data comes from the slave rather than the master. Outside of that, the dialogue is essentially the same as for a data O. Notice that information is placed on the data lines at the same time the slave asserts slave sync. The master strobes in the data and then clears all of its signals. Again, this dialogue is the same for either a data I or data IP transaction. Now, let's look at the various Unibus control signals discussed in this study unit. As you can see, there are five signals associated with interrupts. The BR, BG, and SAC signals are used to make the request, honor the request, and acknowledge that the device is to be the next bus master. Once this is done, the device issues bus busy to gain bus control and asserts the interrupt signal to inform the processor that the device needs help. Note that there are seven signals associated with data transactions. The first four are used to gain bus control in the same manner as for interrupts.
The only difference is that the request and grant signals are called NPR and NPG rather than BR and BG. The C0 and C1 signals specify the type of data transaction. The two sync signals, master sync and slave sync, are part of the dialogue between the master and slave devices. Well, that wraps up our review. Now we're going to finish this study unit by going through a typical example of a device requesting and using the Unibus. In this example, we'll assume that device A is a magnetic tape unit that has both an interrupt and a direct memory access capability. Suppose the tape unit wishes to inform the CPU that it has completed a data transfer. It requests control by issuing a BR. If it has the highest priority of any requesting device, then the priority control grants bus control by issuing a BG. The tape unit responds by asserting SAC and waits for the bus to become free. Once the bus is free, the tape unit interrupts the CPU to inform it that it is ready for a new job. At this point, the tape unit releases the bus so the CPU can take over and service the interrupt. In effect, the tape unit waits for new orders from the CPU. Now, let's assume that the CPU has ordered the tape unit to transfer data into core memory. The tape unit again gains bus control, but this time it issues an NPR request. After the NPG grant and the release of the bus, the tape unit captures the bus and performs a data transfer. When starting the transfer, the tape unit specifies the slave device, in this case the core memory, and chooses the type of transfer, in this case a data O. Once the data transfer has been completed, the tape unit releases control of the bus. In the meantime, what's been happening to other devices while the tape unit has been doing the transfer? Once device A asserts bus control by issuing bus busy, the priority control is free to service other bus requests. As you can see here, device B's request for bus control is granted while device A is executing a data transaction or issuing an interrupt. Device B then takes over the bus as soon as device A releases it. We do not have to wait for a request to be made and granted. That was done earlier. Once device B has bus control, then it can perform an interrupt or data transfer while a third device is making a bus request, and so on. Now we have one more job to do. We'd now like you to take a test. Remember that this test is self-scoring and will be seen by no one but you. Once the test is completed, based on your results, either review the material in this study unit or proceed to the next study unit, which is devoted to priority control. When you hear the next tone, turn off this playback unit and take the test located in the last section of your workbook.